Today we talk about thin endometrial linings during embryo transfers. Is the one time thin is not in. I'm Dr. Mark Amos, and this is Taco About Fertility Tuesday. I know, I know, my joke was a dad joke about Thin not being in. But I'm a dad, so I'm allowed to make those corny jokes. But the point is that this is the one time that Thin is not a good thing. But the thing is, what does that mean when your endometrial lining is thin? Does that mean you won't get pregnant? Or does that mean you have to think that your chances are lower? And what can you do about it? Just recently, I did a podcast on comparing apples to oranges. And this is exactly a situation where I see this happen. It's very easy to compare yourself with linings. But does that mean that it's the same reason why someone's lining is thin? The one thing that is known is that when the lining is under 6 millimeters, there is a reduction in pregnancy rates. You can feel comfortable with that. But it doesn't mean you can't get pregnant. Matter of fact, when they've done studies where they have looked at giving embryo transfers regardless of the lining and just put it back, there were still pregnancies under six, but they were lower. Now, not zero, but just lower. The ideal thickness we tend to want between somewhere between seven and 10 millimeters. There is a point where it can be too big, but studies have been kind of all over the place when it comes to how significant that is. When I first started, I really was stingy on 8 millimeters. I feel much more comfortable now with 7 millimeters. But the point is, what about these thin linings? Do we need to be worried about them? Well, the studies have shown that the appearance of the lining does matter more. And that plays a big part in whether I'm very concerned or not. If someone has a thin lining, but the lining looks amazing, I feel much more comfortable moving forward with the transfer than someone who has a lining that's thick that doesn't look good. And that's actually what the studies show is that the appearance of the lining matters more than even the thickness. But that doesn't mean if two linings look immaculate, that the lining that is 10 would be better than the lining that is 5. So the look is important, but you still want some of that thickness. Now what's important to understand is it's not linear with regards to pregnancy rates. So that doesn't mean people who get a 10 millimeter lining have a better pregnancy rate than people who have a 7 millimeter lining. That is not seen. But there is a point where it gets so small under 6 that the pregnancy rates start to go down, but again, never get to zero. Personally, I had a patient who did a transfer with a 4 millimeter lining. That was the thickest we could get it, and she was able to get pregnant and carry the pregnancy. Now, I just mentioned a second ago about comparing yourself, and why I brought that up is because A thin lining isn't always the same as a thin lining in each person. A thin lining in someone who underwent IVF, never had any trauma to the uterus, and just doesn't make a thick lining is different than the person who's had, let's say, Asherman syndrome, which is scarring that now has affected the uterus, creating pathology and preventing it from getting thicker. And this seems pretty obvious, but it's not. I have many patients who come to me and say, oh, my lines thin. Can I do this? This other person did it. And the thing is, is that their thinness is different. Theirs is pathological, whereas the person who has a thinner lining who just doesn't make a thick lining is physiological. Now, there are many reasons that can cause lines not to be thick. Obviously, one of them is scarring. Scarring can make your lining thinner because there's not tissue there to build up but also estrogen levels being low. So maybe the estrogen you're taking isn't doing as well. And as I talked about in our last episode about natural frozen embryo transfers, there are some people who just do better when the endogenous hormone from their natural body creates a lining and sometimes make a thicker lining then. But the most important point here is to understand there is a very, very big difference between someone who makes a thin lining with no pathology, and someone who makes the thin lining with pathology, whether that was from infection, 
whether it's from a surgery, whatever the reason is, those are completely two different things and the way you treat them are completely different. So let's start first with a situation where it's surgical. This is someone who has had scarring, whether through infection, through surgery, for whatever reason, there is now pathology in their uterus. This is one of the worst situations you can have. And the reason why is because the treatment is usually surgery, and surgery sometimes leads to more scarring and sometimes never even really gets the lining back to normal. Depending on how severe you are in the beginning, such as never getting a period, it can be very, very dismal of having success. If you're someone who has some bit of a period, even just spotting, there's some tissue there, and it may be able to be fixed with surgery if there's scarring in there. Now, there are other treatments too, what are called PRP treatments, plasma-rich proteins that are then extracted from your blood and put into the uterine cavity that can help repair it. But these things are not perfect. Not everyone who does it has their uterus returned back to normal. I can tell you in the most extreme cases, I've never seen someone go from a Asherman syndrome to a normal cavity, but I've seen improvements. People who have mild scarring in their uterus have seen even larger improvements. But why this is important is, is that taking something like Viagra isn't going to help you as much. If your issue is pathology, it's not about blood flow. It's not about the way you're taking estrogen. And so it's hard to understand that because people keep reading things online saying, well, this person did this, this person took this. But the thing is, it's different. Their lining wasn't making a thick lining. And so in that situation, changing the estrogen modality, whether injection or vaginal, or even adding PRP therapy might help them because their issue wasn't pathology. But when your issue is pathology, those things don't work as well. Doesn't mean you can't try them. But it's important to understand why your physician or whoever you're working with is telling you that it's probably not going to be a way to success by using those because they're not addressing the problem. And the problem is pathology at the lining. Sadly, a lot of these patients have to go on to use surrogates because there's no way to get their lining back to normal. Now, again, those are usually the most extreme examples of Asherman syndrome where the uterus completely is scarred down, and rarely even bleeds anymore. I've had several patients with that, and about 33% of them have gone on to have pregnancies with severe Ashermans with no periods. Unfortunately, the other 66% either got pregnant and lost the pregnancy or ended up using a surrogate to end up having their family. So what about then the other situation when the lying's thin, when it's not pathological? Well, then in that situation, that's where you have to look at everything. So if one person goes through a programmed frozen embryo transfer and their lining is, let's say, five and a half millimeters, I'm not too worried as the first try. And what I usually do is I look at their IVF cycle and say, well, how thick did their lining get into an IVF cycle? If it got the nine, then there's no question their lining can get thicker. I usually give them the choice of saying, listen, we can do another program cycle. We'll adjust the estrogen. Clearly, your body can make a thicker lining. And then if it doesn't, we can always go into a natural cycle because we know that will definitely work for you. Sometimes patients don't want to take that kind of trial and error. So they say, no, I'll just go right to the natural FET. And as we talked about in the last podcast, the chances are the same as with using a program cycle, just a higher risk of canceling. Usually we do another transfer cycle and everything goes fine. But sometimes the lines thin again. And that's when we start trying things like changing the type of estrogen. So whether it's We talked about vaginal, there are patches, there are injections. There are many ways to give estrogen and that for some people that may affect them. So let's say you had a gastric bypass surgery. Well, then oral pills probably aren't going to work for you. So you're going to need either do vaginal, injectable, or patches. Now, if I make those adjustments and the patient lining gets thick again, I'm not worried. But what about those patients that we do all those things? The ones who even during their IVF cycles, we notice their lining never gets thick. Well, then in those patients, we want to first look for pathology, right? So we want to make sure, is there scarring? And although a sonohistogram is a very good test, at that point, when we're talking about linings not get thick enough, it's probably right to go to a hysteroscopy because at that point, 
you want to look with your eyes to look at the tissue. Is the tissue pink? Does it look like it's responding? Is the surface scarred? Those things you really can't see in a sonohistogram, and so a hysteroscopy would be warranted at that time. Now, obviously, if you found something that was wrong, you would then surgically treat that, and like we said, things like PRP treatment. But what if nothing was found wrong? This person just makes thin linings. It doesn't matter what we do. Well, then in that situation, what I find is there usually is a timing situation associated with this. What I'm talking about is the ERA, endometrial receptivity assessment test. I find when the lining is thin and never gets thicker, no matter what we do, almost always, more than 50% of the time, I would say even more than 75% of the time, the timing is off and that the progesterone needs to be adjusted. Ever since I've started doing that and we've found that they were off, I've had very good success with thin linings. I don't even get worried about thin linings anymore because now I know I'm addressing the situation, but I still go through those patterns of checking, was it pathological? Is there anything else that can fix it? But when it can, the one most important thing is making sure is the timing correct. Once that is done, I usually end up having success. Now, remember, nothing's perfect. No one gets pregnant 100%. But what I'm saying is that I don't see the reduced pregnancy rates that we usually would see with less than six. So if you're one of those patients who has a thin lining, the question you need to ask yourself is, is it pathological that I need to be worried about? Or is it just something physiological? If it's physiological, work with your doctors to figure out if it is something due to the estrogen where you're taking it, or could it be something like we talked about where you had a medical problem that's affecting the estrogen? Once that's determined, you can determine if it's pathological or physiological, then you can make your adjustments. But like I said, although I don't have a study to prove this right now, I tend to see that when people don't get a thick lining, no matter what we do, and there's not a pathological reason behind it, doing an ERA improves your chances tremendously. And that's one thing I would recommend to my patients. And even if you're not my patient, I would recommend you do that, especially if you're having problems. Hopefully this was a helpful episode to some of you, or maybe it was something you're concerned about. So now you feel more comfortable that like, okay, I know what they're going to do next. And I know what I need to worry about. As always, if you like this, please tell everyone about us, tell your friends about us, tell your parents about us, even though they're not trying to probably get pregnant and give us a five-star review on your favorite podcast medium. Until next week, I'll talk to you on Talk About Fertility Tuesday.